This week is going to be an overview of what risk management is. <clears throat> I'm going to try to explain why risk management is one of the areas where mathematicians so, are so actively hired within the banking sector and in the insurance sector to some extent. And everything we have seen in the course will help us understand that. Today is going to be an overview. Next week, I will get uh, very specific about one type of risk management, which is credit risk. Credit risk is going to be at the um, crossroads between risk management, as I will stand today, and trading, as we have seen in the past, because uh, credit risk management continues to be an area of profitability. And that is how I will address it also study this week. But today, it's all about risk management. I want you to understand the math and the reasons why mathematicians are so uh, active in the space in the financial sector. And I want to start with um, some review of history. I want to look at what I call 100 years of failures. I have here in front of you approximately the last 100 years of stock market performance. I will use the stock market to try to describe what happened over the last 100 years, which is how risk management has been established today. It's to deal with things that have happened. A lot of the risk management that is done is trying to react to situations that happened before. Uh, not a lot of risk management is proactive in trying to react to things that have never happened. Okay, <clears throat> and here we have the. Uh, I want to st I want to start with a comment, which is that the financial markets are much older than one hundred years. The futures markets have been around since the end of the seventeenth century. That's that's a long time ago, and the uh, bond market started in the nineteenth century, perhaps in connection with the expansion of the railroad to the west in the United States. Bonds have been around for a long time, uh, shortly after futures, but the big growth of the bond market was as the railroad uh, tried to expand west in the United States. Markets have been around for a long time, but we're going to focus on, 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 on the origins of risk management, which are more linked to the behavior of stocks, which is what you have in front of you here. And perhaps the first event that gave rise to the major wave in risk management activity was the 1929 crash. Uh, we're going to review today a little bit of what happened there to understand uh, the context. But this gave rise to <clears throat> a, a lot of legislation, which was not uh, very mathematical, but it's still it has shaped financial markets in a way that we cannot ignore. That was then followed by the um, a crisis that was 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 it took several decades and it was linked to the oil um, crisis at the beginning of of the century. Oil became an important commodity. It fueled industrial expansion. It fueled transportation, and a few years after that, oil the scarcity of oil and the problems between the United States and Iran gave rise to uh, very <clears throat> uh, volatile market behavior. You can see uh, that here somehow in this graph, it was reflected on the stock market, but there's things which are not reflected here, like for example, the fact that on average, six banks failed per year <clears throat> in the United States during this period. So you know Silicon Valley Bank, it happened a couple of years ago. Imagine that happening six times every year for several decades. That was the, the context. It, I'm trying to get you to understand what happened then. The result of all of this was the creation of derivatives. The, the derivatives markets that we have been analyzing in such great detail in the first half of this course were very much linked to that. We already saw examples in which derivatives could be used as risk management or risk avoidance or risk mitigation strategies. We saw how with call options you can 
hedge against, for example, currencies dropping or uh, prices climbing. We saw that. And this is the reason that, uh, that uh, derivatives grew so much. So what we said in the first half of this core, course and what we looked at from a theoretical perspective is actually true. That's exactly what happened. And now I can tell you it was precisely um, to address a lot of the risks and volatility that arose around the post oil crisis era in, in, in the world. A lot of the derivatives were, were created for that. And when I say oil crisis, I'm not referring to the prices of, of crude oil. Uh, crude oil had a tremendous impact, for example, on interest rates. Interest rates were very volatile. So interest rate derivatives became a very important uh, instrument to, to prevent industrials, industrial companies from uh, the volatility arising from the market. As you know, industrial companies, they need to borrow money. We saw that in the first half of this course. And when you're not sure where interest rates go, that gives rise to uncertainty, gives rise to volatile balance sheets. And the way to do that, the way, sorry, the way to mitigate a lot of that was through the use of, of derivatives. So that was the context in which derivatives occurred. And then a very important event happened in 1987. It's an important event, perhaps not for the history of the world, but for the reason why mathematics became relevant. We're going to see this event in some detail today because this event gave rise to the, perhaps the first wave of mathematicians being hired in the bank. So we want to understand what happened there and the type of math that that grew up uh, as a result of that event. That was then followed by September 11. Of course, the World Trade Center uh, collapse, but also perhaps even more important for us today is the Enron collapse, uh, which also had impacts on, on regulation and gave rise to quantitative easing. This is the policy of the Federal Reserve Bank to make money cheaper which gave rise to the credit bubble that um, made all structured credit instruments grow over time. And then that led to the crash of 2008. So you can see all of these events are linked to each other one way or another. And today we're going to be trying to understand how all of these things are pieced together. Today will be an overview of many things that have happened. And for that, I want you to have in mind this um, relationship between events and regulation. So the 1929 crash gave rise to the Securities Act of 1933. We're going to see what that means today. Uh, perhaps this is not too relevant for mathematicians, but it was extremely relevant for the markets pre-1929, actually pre-1933. Uh, financial markets were very unregulated. We're going to see examples of things that could happen back then that today cannot happen. They, were, they are illegal today. But again, I want you to understand 1929 crash, 1933 Investors Act. Uh, the crash of uh, October 19, uh, 1987, 1987 gave rise to the, um, the first uh, regulation of the Bank for International Settlements, BIS. And the events of <clears throat> August of 1998 gave rise to BIS too. The events of 1998, in case you don't know, are started with two uh, geopolitical events. One was the default of Russia on their, uh, on their bonds and in, uh, in August of 1998. And the same week was the impeachment in Congress of uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, all of these events, gave, what they did is they created a, a dry up in the credit market. We'll see credit risk next week, but you can imagine when big geopolitical events happen, people are not very willing to lend to others. Hmm? So credit market just, just straight up. Imagine very busy credit trading centers in, in big banks where typically the phones are ringing off the hook nonstop. Imagine all quiet for a week. OK, that is that is what this created tremendous dislocation in prices, which created a very big spread on the 
a margin requirements of, ver of a very large hedge fund at the time that was long-term capital management. And that uh, created a tremendous um, stress on the bond market because uh, long-term capital management controlled through derivatives approximately $1 trillion worth of um, bonds. And that is a huge amount. And, uh, it's a huge amount today. It was a huge amount, even bigger amount back in 1998. So the result of that was another piece of regulation, which is BIS-2. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of these details. Okay, again, action and reaction. <clears throat> the Enron 2001 gave rise to another piece of legislation called the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation of 2002, or typically referred to as SOX 2002. We're not going to see that. Here, but it's another example of action and reaction. The crisis of 2008 that I think is more familiar to you gave rise to the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, much of which was repealed by Trump in, its, uh, administ in his administration, but still action reaction. Um, there is an event that has not happened yet, but it's something which I just want to flag here for your, for your information, and this is uh, one that may give rise to data regulation. Data is not regulated yet, but um, we may have an event coming that will give rise to data regulation. This way of thinking of action or reaction can lead us to think about events that could happen like that. COVID-19 has not led to um, regulation yet, but it, it may. And something which is very interesting, and I would like to touch on at the end of today, is another event or may, maybe an event which is perhaps bound to happen, and that is a, a climate risk. I told you that risk management is very reactionary. You can see this in, you know, you have a column uh, to the left followed by a column to the right that happen after. This is perhaps one case in which risk management is trying to be proactive. And <clears throat> the way climate risk finds its way into uh, financial, uh, the financial sector is through uh, what's called Article 2.1c of the Paris Accord. The Paris Accord is, is, is an agreement signed by uh, most, most, most countries on earth. And in that Article 2.1c, it states that the financial sector will be the mechanism that will be used to um, address the emission reduction objectives of the Paris Accord. We'll talk about this uh, towards the end of today. This is, by the way, perhaps one of the areas that's creating biggest fund flows or biggest money flows today. Um, flows in the financial sector related to either uh, climate action or issues related to other uh, sustainability. The financial sector, as you know, is there to provide financing to activities which which, uh, which mankind wants to undertake. So when, when, when humans want to do something about climate action, the financial sector shows up. And uh, it is from that perspective that we'll be addressing that uh, today. Now, when this is 100 years of failures, if I look at 100 years of risk analysis, <clears throat> what I can tell you is that about 100 years ago, the way risk analysis was done was very different from today. Um, the concept of risk had not been really uh, invented yet. Most of the activities in finance was to find the best stock at the best price or to find the best bond at the best yield. And that started to change in 1950 with the work of Harry Markovich. Harry Markovich was perhaps the first that coined the term risk within the financial sector. He wrote a paper that was really not very well not very promptly received by the financial community. But what's important to point out is that this came in the year 1950, which is around the time that the first computer was built, more or less. Um, and this is another interesting relationship between risk management and technology. The theories of Markovitz would have been, which we will see in some detail later in this course, would have been very, very nice theoretically, but they would have been not implementable without computers. He is the one that perhaps for the first time was using time series analysis in a consistent way. And time series without a computer is something that, you know, to do this uh, time series by hand, it's just not practical. 
So there is some alignment of uh, occurrences between people making discoveries like Harry Markovich and then the fact that technology, computers in particular, were created at the same time. Okay. Then throughout uh, the next uh, 50 years, what we saw is tremendous growth in, on the one hand, on our technology, ability, our ability to deal with technology enhancements. You know, eventually everybody had a computer on their desk, which in 1950s was, was unthinkable. And at the same time, the growth of a lot of the um, risk management systems, but also investment systems and banking systems and trading systems. We saw a tremendous growth of that. And then perhaps that peaked in the year 2020, when now something happened, which is, is, is changing everything all over again. And that is the arrival of, on the one hand, artificial intelligence, or maybe similarly, the fact that now we can deal with not just time series analysis, not just streams of data which are very long and numerical, but streams of data which are even longer and textual or including sensor data, images, video. The fact that now we have a, a data which can be used for many applications is changing the way we do things. And of course, artificial intelligence is the big uh, partner of this evolution that's happening today. I'll, and this will be especially relevant as we talk about uh, climate risk and ESG and things like that, which I will do towards the end of today's class. Mm? Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of risks, what, what risks are we talking about? So risk has what's called a taxonomy. A taxonomy is the classification of risks. And I will start with the first, which is the one that is most often understood as risk, and that is the market risk. Uh, the market risk is refers to the loss of value, net asset value, NAV, the loss of value due to changes in asset prices. A stock that you own goes down, you lose money, that is called market risk. Mm -hmm. um, you, you hold an option, it expires worthless, you lost the entire option value, that's market risk. Credit risk is different. Credit risk is when someone is supposed to pay you something and they don't. Prices didn't particularly change. It's just that someone did something which is not illegal uh, because bankruptcy is legal. It is allowed by the law, but someone just does not fulfill their obligations. That's credit risk. And by the way, this is what we'll be devoting next week's class entirely, credit risk. Liquidity risk is a different type of risk, is uh, the situation where you have a delay in turning your assets into cash. Through the first half of this course, we have assumed that people work for free. We also assume that if you have an asset in cash or, uh, or in a security, we didn't care. We considered assets to be indistinguishable. We considered cash, stock, options to be the same, no more. In fact, uh, the, the difficulty of turning asset value into cash is what is called liquidity risk. Uh, there are some uh, good examples of that. Uh, perhaps one of the most um, interesting is the case of the Hunt brothers in the 80s. They were, um, they were active traders in the silver market and they were doing very well until one day they got a marching call for a billion dollars or something like that. It was in the 80s. That was a lot of money back then. Hmm? And, and uh, the Hunt brothers, they had the rights to the, uh, to the um, um, oil in, in Alaska or something like that, which is worth much more than that. But of course, you cannot turn that into, into cash in 24 hours. When situations like that happen, this is, this is referred to as a liquidity event. You cannot turn your assets into cash, into liquid cash too quickly. And then the losses that arise from that are called liquidity risk. Um, gap risk is something which I'll just mention it for you. It's a little bit more rare. Is, 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 is the risk that an investment price will change very, very suddenly from one value to another, but that's because of lack of trading. Okay. For example, if you, um, if, if you, uh, if you go to, to a stock market that trades very infrequently, there are, stock, there are stocks that in certain exchanges, in, in, in Lima, for example, that they would only trade maybe every six months. Okay? They say very, they, there are trades very, very um, uh, far apart from each other. 
then you have something that you think is worth a hundred dollars and then it's constant for a hundred dollars because there's no trade and then suddenly there's a trade that prices that are at 50. you just lost 50 percent why well you can say it's, it's market risk it is a type of market risk but it's a very precise type of market risk or if you want to say it's, it's it's a type of also liquidity risk because you have an asset that just had no 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 liquidity whatsoever and then when it finally trades again or when you finally have a market price it turns out that it's dropped by a large amount that is called gap risk <clears throat> legal risk is um, another example of of, um, of of risk is is when you lose uh, money because of uh, a changes in the law uh, perhaps the most interesting case of this is the case of a banker's trust that we may have mentioned here briefly in the past. Uh, banker's trust was a bank in New York. I think it was bought by Citibank eventually, but it was a, it was a very active bank in the derivatives uh, business in New York who um, did a very famous, sold a very famous swap to Procter & Gamble. The result of which was, was that um, uh, Procter & Gamble ended up on the losing side of that swap systematically. We, we talked about this when we talked about derivatives um, earlier in this course. And uh, well, the result of that is that one shareholder in Procter & Gamble was very upset and then sued Bankers Trust because they argued that derivatives is gambling because you have an outcome that depends on a random event, just like gambling. And gambling is illegal in the state of New York. So if that had actually um, persisted, then derivatives would have suddenly become illegal. And if that happens, then all the losses that you would face because of that would be called or will be under the type of legal risk. And perhaps finally, in my taxonomy of today, operational risk. Operational risk is typically risk which are due to fraud, uh, trading mistakes, cybersecurity is considered to be a type of operational risk, and so on and so forth. This is a, a catch-all uh, term that adopts many different types of risks. If any one of you is going to be working in the financial sector under risk management, you could be dealing with any one of these. Most of you, if you work in the risk management sector, will probably be under market, although more and more and more of you would be under a credit. In credit, you will also be doing credit trading, which is very similar to risk management, but it leads to, gener to a revenue generation. It's not only um, uh, mitigating losses in the way we will see today. And the operational risk used to be an area of active hiring. It's um, perhaps less now. Regulators are backtracking some of the regulation that was passed years ago. However, cybersecurity is on the rise. So we're going to see more and more activity on the cybersecurity front. And if any one of you has a background in technology, this is this could be a very attractive area for you uh, to 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 deal with. OK, so that you have a, an idea of the landscape of jobs that exist out there. And in terms of risk classification, I have here a, a table that includes some um, description of the risk that we have. So for market risk, under, under market risk, if you go to a bank, for example, the type of um, uh, jobs that you would do there in a bank, they will have to do, for example, with implementation of Basel I. Um, for example, the, the, the concept of value at risk that we'll see here today, or for example, the implementation of a Basel III. And currently, or at least up until recently, the uh, financial review of the trading book is, for example, one of the themes that was very big in the financial sector. Okay, if you're going to do a, I'm not going to describe FRTB is too, too, too technical, but if you're going to be doing a, a, a job interview in a bank on, 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 mar on a market risk uh, department, the VAR you will see here, the value at risk you will see here, but do review the FRTB. Uh, okay, and, and see what that's, uh, what that's all about. <clears throat> However, if you go into the insurance sector, that has a different um, tone altogether. Um, solvency 2 
is one of the latest waves of regulation for the financial sector in Europe, in North America, in Canada, and the United States. It has, it has different names, but insurance uh, companies are subject to market risk regulation and the calculation of what's called solvency capital ratios, which is a measure of how much money <clears throat> a, a, an insurance company should keep aside for the creation of, or for, at least for the uh, mitigation of uh, possible losses. We will see in detail how this is done today. When you look into the asset management side, which perhaps these are the three big pillars of the financial sector, banking, insurance, and asset management. When you look into the asset management side, um, the concept of market risk takes a different, <clears throat> a different tone. On the one hand, it's not regulated. In the, in the asset management side, market risk is what traders do. They take market for a living. They take market risk for a living. And the type of regulation that operates there is different. It's the one that has more to do with securities regulation, which we'll also briefly review today. Okay. However, you may have uh, limits on concentration exposures or sector exposures or things like that. It's completely different for the investment sector as it is for banking or insurance. When you go to credit, uh, the credit risk um, activity within a bank is typically going to be linked to Basel II, the Basel II regulation, uh, or a type of Basel III, um, part of the directive within Basel III, which has to do with uh, CVA, credit value adjustment. We're not going to see CVA in this course. We will see credit bar in great detail uh, next, uh, next week and the week after. Okay. <clears throat> uh, when you go to the insurance sector, credit risk is part of the regulation and it just appears as it did within market risk. And in the case of asset management, credit risk is, is again very different. Um, you deal typically with counterparties, which are typically uh, banks. So the concept of credit is, is different and it becomes an act of um, uh, getting a good due diligence activity within your uh, fund or having uh, <clears throat> um, appropriate credit premium. We will see examples of this when we study investments uh, exactly three weeks from today. Okay, so I'm going to spend today talking about risk management, mostly from a banking perspective. The next two weeks talking about credit risk trading, both from a banking as well as from an investment management perspective. And then I will spend a couple of weeks on investments. There we will see credit appear again, but usually it's very different from the type of risk management we're doing today. Okay, so all of these things is we're going to be seeing this over the next three weeks. <clears throat> Operational risk, we're not going to see in this course. <clears throat> This is the, the, the part that I told you has to do with uh, cybersecurity, fraud, uh, operational mistakes. You may have seen that on occasion, you see in the news, a certain bank trader made a mistake. They added a zero to a trade, uh, which is called a fat finger uh, error. And then the bank is out billions because of that, right? So that is also under, under um, operational risk. <clears throat> And liquidity risk, we, we mentioned what it is earlier. In the case of uh, banks, um, there are some examples of um, uh, how this appears and how these things are dealt with. We're not going to review this in this course. In the case of insurance, there are also um, um, aspects in which this show up in, in the insurance sector. We're not going to see that. And in the case of asset management, it's dealt with in an ad hoc basis. So liquidity risk is important, it's there, but it's not as systematized as credit and market risks are. Gap risk, I'm not going to talk about that right now. Now, legal risk is, is, um, is, is quite interesting because it is an area where um, practitioners have to be very alert. Um, the, the problem with legal risk is that it can change everything very quickly overnight and um, and it might although it might be different from uh, the risk departments uh, it is an area which is at the crossroads between the risk management as we will see in this course and the law the legal part of of a bank okay I, I will tell you 
that some of my students who pursued a career in risk management, at some point they thought to be optimal for themselves to get a law degree, okay? And some of them became lawyers. So if you have that temptation in your career at some point, you're not alone. And, and in fact, uh, it may very well be that this is the right move for you. So it is not strange. Don't, don't think that any one of you becoming a lawyer later in your life is, a, is necessarily a bad move, okay? It could be a very good one. Just, just be aware of that. <clears throat> and in the case of asset management, legal risk is actually far more relevant. Um, th there are, in particular, in the case of, um, of uh, securities laws, there are many situations where there are many situations where uh, the law can have a tremendous impact on your portfolio activities. Uh, I have here, for example, MNPI. That's the use of material non-public information or the change of trading rules. Uh, these things, uh, these things happen. And asset managers have to be very well aware of these changes and they have to adapt their trading activity to that. We may see examples of that when we talk about investments a few, a few weeks from now. And cybersecurity is something that I want to um, highlight as a topic of, of greatest um, importance. Um, it affects, for example, online banking. Uh, if, if uh, for example, a, a, if, if you had a quantum computer, uh, now, uh, in, in the way that uh, theoretically quantum computers could work in the future, um, it is estimated that you could break into an online system in a matter of minutes. Hmm? This is, of course, a big risk for a bank, and they have to be um, alert to that. The way that a, a lot of the uh, transactions happen, which is purely electronic, is another area where um, cybersecurity would have a, an impact, okay? And it, it's an area which is extremely, extremely active. One of the chief risk officers of a major Canadian bank who, who I knew, he told me that he spent about 40%, 4-0, 40% of his time on cybersecurity issues. So, very important. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, the insurance sector, uh, it's the same thing, but it's something very interesting because for, this, for, for the insurance sector, this could actually be a revenue generator. If you look at the legend that I have in this table here, you would see that I have included a, a legend where um, I distinguish between the, the items here which are regulated, these are regulated, these are regulated. The companies do it because they have to, even if they don't want to. Hmm? And some of them are, are revenue generators. Cybersecurity is actually a revenue generator for insurance companies. Insurance companies can actually make money on cybersecurity policies, and some do. Okay, so that's a very interesting uh, perspective on that. Note that in my legend, I also have here the unregulated type, which is things that people do because they want it, not because they have to. And a lot of the asset management is, 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 is done like that. A lot of these areas are not regulated. Uh, companies will do it because it's good for them, okay? The ones which are in red are the ones that companies do because they have to do that. The regulators will force them to do that. If you want to stay in business, you have to do that, okay? This is important when you get a job uh, to understand if your activity is regulated or not. If it's regulated, then uh, your institution will have external obligations to do certain things, and that's going to make your job very much uh, independent of the institution that you're working at. They just have to do what has to be done. Uh, if your job is not regulated, then the institution could change their mind if you're, what you're doing is important or not. So it is important when you get a job to understand if your activity is there because it makes money, because it satisfies a fulfills a regulatory requirement or if it's something that the company does because they think it's a good idea okay that's advice that i give you for when you um, uh, have a job or even when you interview for a job try to understand why that job exists i have some cases here that perhaps i'm not going to go through 
Um, these are, uh, perhaps I leave them here for your uh, inspection. If you want to understand a little bit better what some of these examples or sorry, this terminology, this taxonomy is, I, I, I suggest you, you know, even Google these terms and you'll have, get stories. You can spend easily an hour on each one of these stories. Uh, we're going to uh, see some of them in this course. This first one we will see when we look at investments. So this is a case that I will explain to you. Um, the case of orange, orange candy, I briefly mentioned that when we're looking at um, the, the structure of the fixed income market. And I mentioned to you how the Orange County went bankrupt when um, the interest rates rose very quickly. And then although they had zero duration, their exposure to curve tilting was very high and they went bankrupt on a 200 basis points move of the curve that way. Okay, I think we, we talked about that. There, there are great cases written about this. Um, <clears throat> the Talia is a very interesting case of commodity trading. We're not going to review that here. Bankers Trust, I just mentioned to, that to you very briefly. Uh, but you can Google that and you can you can get a very good understanding of these uh, topics through these cases. I don't have time to do uh, in, in, in this course. Uh, but if any one of you has the interest, um, I encourage you to to dig deeper into some of these some of these cases. Okay. And the Volkswagen short squeeze, we will see that in this course. We will see that when we talk about um, uh, shorting stocks. It is a very interesting case of um, long-term capital management. I mentioned that here <clears throat> uh, briefly. I will explain that in some detail also later on when we look at investments. So some of these are things that we will see in this course. Others are just things that I will not see, but I give you these names. You can Google them if you are interested and you will get some uh, good stories that will help you complement what we're seeing here with, with actual cases that gave rise to significant losses and also significant headlines. People in the financial sector, they need to know these things. <clears throat> Perhaps this is a good point to to mention something, another piece of advice for you when you go for a job interview. It's good to know the theory. It's good to know what an option is and how you price these things. Uh, it's good to know what credit risk is and how you price a credit derivative, which we will see in this course. But it's also good to know things that actually happened in the market. It's good to have this practical knowledge. Of course, people in the financial sector, they knew this because they go to work every day and they are confronted with these things. But you as students, perhaps with some internship experience, if you are familiar with these events that actually happened, this is something which is very good for you to know. This is another reason that I try to bring up these, uh, these discussions, these cases, as they become relevant in what we're talking about. It's good um general knowledge that you that you need to have okay in particular when we talk about investments i will try to bring up a lot of those um when we understand for example a trading strategy later on it's good to understand who did it when it worked when it didn't work and why okay to get that uh, that cultural understanding we, we will be doing that for now let me just leave these cases here and if you're interested google them you can get very good information on, on these cases uh, on your own. And <clears throat> when I'm talking about risk management, one very important player, one very important regulatory player in risk management is the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Mm -hmm. uh, they dict it's an international group of, um, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a committee uh, with international members that dictates a lot of the uh, banking um, best practices for central banks, which regulate the banks within their country. And <clears throat> um, I want to give you some, again, some uh, knowledge of things that actually happened, part of what, you know, the, 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 the events that happened that is good for you to know. Um, the, stock, the stock market crash, for example, of 1987, October 19, 1987, uh, something that happened because I think I mentioned it was perhaps the first example of computerized trading uh, on, on the options market where a volatility event unraveled and gave rise to 
very active trading that ended up um, sending the um, the stock market in a tailspin in just a few hours. Mm -hmm. So the reason for that is that options are nonlinear instruments. This is going to become a very important topic for some of the risk measures we're going to be developing here. Mm -hmm. And that event that happened gave rise to the um, if, if the resolution in 1991 of the Bank for International Settlements for what's called the Bank International Treaty for Risk Management. Then one bank, JP Morgan, very quickly reacted to this, proposing a methodology for risk management called the Risk Matrix methodology in 1994, a version of which was adopted and passed into law as part of what's called the Basel One, uh, which aimed to to have a good handle on the market risk in the banking sector. And this had to be uh, put in place by December 31st of 1997. So January 1st, 1998 is when the banks had a, a, the first um, a, a risk, market risk management system in place. Along those lines, something very interesting happened. JP Morgan continued and tried to create another standard for credit risk management. Um, Basel I only looked at market. Uh, credit was something that was going to be to win you know, later on. And in 1997, JP Morgan came up with a proposal for uh, one possible methodology called credit matrix. And it so happened that long-term capital management blew up in 1998, just a few months before the market risk um, uh, regulation had been uh, put into place, and but not in advance of the regulation. Perhaps with appropriate regulation, uh, uh, long-term capital management would not have blown up, perhaps. But in any way, this gave rise to the Basel II uh, legislation, which was aimed at at uh, preventing events such as the one that gave rise to long-term capital management. Rem remember what I told you: risk management is followed is 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 full is full of actions followed by reactions, and this is one example. Perhaps with the credit matrix methodology, which was proposed in 1997. Perhaps the banking sector could have um, been proactive as opposed to reactive, and they missed that by a few months. Okay. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> uh, this is what happened, and then Basel III came up that addressed market risk and operational risk, and there's been you know, many, many um, uh, variations on that. And every time you have one of these regulations, the next regulation that comes up is even longer. Um, uh, Basel III is thousands and thousands of pages now. Okay, I, At this point, I may hypothesize to you that a lot of these uh, legislations in a few years may only be understood by a, a chat GPT form of a, um, a system because the, 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 the way this regulation is growing in terms of the sheer number of pages that it takes to write it is just very, very large. So um, who knows, maybe there's a, a job for many of you to be the um, IT department behind the uh, legal uh, implementation of some of these um, some of these systems because they will have to very likely have to use artificial intelligence because this uh, this le legislation is just getting to be very very large. Okay, we'll see. <clears throat> now, when it comes to asset management, which is a completely different sector, you cannot say a company like BlackRock, for example, is regulated in a completely different way from, for example, J.P. Morgan. They're in completely different uh, businesses. And this is going to start to be very important for us going forward. Okay, we're going to be today talking about a little bit more about banking, but then in three weeks we'll be talking a little bit more about asset management. Very different, um, um, very different businesses. Insurance is also different. They borrow some of the investment management characteristics because they do have to invest the money they charge for uh, for policies. Okay. Um, 
and so they are similar to to a lot of the asset management companies but they are regulated like a bank they're they're different okay and um but i want to spend most of my time talking about banking and asset management less about insurance but when you look at the asset management sector i already mentioned that 1929 was a pivotal year because many things happened that shouldn't have happened and the investors act of 1933 took care of that and that investors act is still in force today if you're going to be uh, getting into the asset management sector you'll have to learn good chunks of it it's this it's all very um, uh, legally driven not a lot of mathematics actually hardly any mathematics there okay but that's how investment companies work okay <clears throat> 2001 gave rise to the enron collapse that changed also some of the uh, chapters and directives in the investors act to enhance the type of um, accounting that you need to do in, in the banks um, and that was done in the uh, SOX uh, legislation of 2002 then we had the great recession that gave rise to the uh, dot frank act some of the things that happened in the in the great recession that you probably know is that some banks according to the regulators they were not acting in the best interest of their customers there are rumors that they were actually trading against them because they had knowledge of some of the things that were coming so they knew that some assets were overpriced and they they traded against uh, their clients interest and what the dot frank act was was somehow an attempt to prevent um, banks from a lot of trading activity this is very important for you because this is perhaps the beginning of a lot of the trading departments within banks to be shut down uh, a lot of the prop trading which was hiring a lot of people like you uh, they started to shut down that activity didn't disappear it just left the bank and it went to for example hedge funds so um, if that is what's happening then from your perspective looking for a job then if you like the type of activity which prop desks did then look no more into the banks look into the hedge funds because they took that activity so these are the, some of the things that i also want you to understand uh, we have seen a lot of uh, finance uh, theories up until now now i need you to be very alert as to which companies with what names do what okay because that's where the jobs are mm -hmm. <clears throat> now just to give you some idea of how asset management was prior to 1929 so you understand the effect that regulation can have uh, let me say that the, the crash of 1929 was followed by a tremendous speculative boom that took place in the late 1920s. <clears throat> Net profits of companies showed an increase of 36% over the year 1928, which was already a record year. So profits of companies was going uh, through the roof. But stock market speculation, perhaps because of this, led hundreds of thousands of Americans to invest very heavily in the stock. In fact, this is perhaps the time when uh, borrowing to invest in stocks, so leveraged investing, became retail. Um, there are estimates that over $8 billion were out on loan, which was more than the entire amount of currency circulated in the United States at the time. This is what's called a bubble. Okay. So the um, the bubble burst, the PE ratio was uh, 32 uh, in September 1929. That's a very high number. That means that stocks were very overpriced. But the most interesting act for me was that of Albert Wiggin. He was the head of the Chase National Bank, who shorted 40,000 shares of his own company, making a four million dollar profit. Four million dollars of the time. This is illegal today. But in 1929, this was legal. You could do things like this, just to show you how action and reaction takes place, okay? Now, um, the, the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision was created in 1974. This is to regulate what banks do. Um, 
Back then, the risk management that was done was very simple. They were just asking banks to keep 8% of their risk-weighted assets. I'll give you an example of what this is. I have a table here with um, uh, the instrument type and the type of um, regulatory capital this gave rise to. So cash required no regulatory capital. Um, bank debt, 20%. Um, uh, 50% for mortgages and 100% for all, all other debt. 8% of risk-weighted assets meant that if you have a, if you're a bank and you have a certain amount of assets, then you're going to be putting a percentage of your assets as regulatory capital. Regulatory capital is where the central bank collects to make up for your potential losses. So this is what's called a linear system. This is very important. We need to understand this today. This is a linear risk management system. And this is what was in place uh, in 1992, a linear system. Now, um, what happened in October 19, 1987? The market dropped 25%. So if the market drops 25%, if you have a linear system, you expect your, um, your uh, capital ratios to change by about 25%. The fact of the matter is that many companies went bankrupt. And the reason is that finance had become non-linear. We already saw that here. We, we saw that if you have a stock that goes to $2.50, your option priced at 33 cents can lose everything or give you a dollar. That gives you um, either a 300% return or a minus 100% loss. That is non-linear. That's a non-linear effect. And risk management became non-linear after this and mathematics was welcome into law, which is the reason that so many mathematicians were hired in the banks. I need you to understand this. And the, the concept that best describes what I'm talking about is this concept called value at risk. It's a nonlinear measure of risk. It's actually more than a measure of risk. It's a measure of regulatory capital. Okay, if, you probably understand the difference of all those terms today. And let me define it for you. This is what banks had to do. Um, the value at risk, I want to explain what value at risk is. And after I'm done explaining that, I want you to do a bit of an introspective to understand the massive change in philosophy. This was for the banking system. Okay, From 8% of your assets to value at risk, the difference is tremendous. So let me define value at risk for you. Let's say you have a portfolio. You're a bank, you have a portfolio. This is all of your mortgages, all of your uh, income, all of your um, uh, deposits, all of your loans, everything. Hmm? <clears throat> That's your portfolio. So the value at risk represents the amount of money you could lose with a certain confidence. For example, let's say 95% confidence. What does that mean? That means if you measure this, for example, daily, 95% means five times out of a hundred or one in 20 or roughly value at risk means your worst daily loss in a month roughly assuming there are 20 days in, in the there's 25 days 25 trading days but if you were 20 there will be like the lost the biggest loss in a given month that's what value at risk is aiming to measure and it's expressed mathematically as this expression here if you have a portfolio you're a bank, you have a portfolio, uh, your portfolio could experience losses periodically. So the, if you look at the losses to be the um, a random variable with the probability distribution given by a number, by a function row, for example, then the value at risk is that percentage that, or, or that number that you're expected to exhibit um, with a certain confidence interval. If your confidence interval is, is 95%, then what I'm, I'm writing here is that the probability that you lose more than that is 5%. So that number is what value at risk will represent. Okay. I have an example here. Let's go through the example and then you'll understand. Imagine that I issue 1000 lottery tickets and in the 1000 lottery tickets, the winner is going to get $1 million from us. Forget about how much we charge for that. We don't charge anything. Uh, that's not relevant, is we have 1,000 lottery tickets and the winner is going to get $1 million from us. 
All right. So let's look at the value at risk numbers as a function of how many tickets we sell. Let's say that we sell only one ticket, only one. So that means that we have 999 tickets in our possession and we sold one. That means that there is a 0.1%, one in a thousand, that we lose a million dollars. What's the quantile of that? The quantile of that is zero. So the value at risk of that portfolio where we sold one lottery ticket is zero. Imagine I sell 49 lottery tickets. The probability that I lose anything is 4.9%. It's just under 5%. So again, with a 95% confidence um, interval, the value at risk number that I have is zero. The minute I sell one more lottery ticket, the minute I sell 50, then I hit that 5%, and then my value at risk is a full million dollars. And if I sell all 1,000 lottery tickets, then my value at risk continues to be $1 million. Okay? So you see, it's a nonlinear measure of risk. It ignores events which are very, very rare. Okay? And when I hit that um, probability of loss, which is given by my confidence interval, then value at risk equals that. So this is a this is what value at risk is. Um, now, um, how do you calculate this in practice? Forget about the lottery ticket now. That is something that I, I presented to you so that um, you see what a quantile is, which you already know, okay? but you'll see that now in, in a practical context. How would a bank do this in, in, in practice? So what it would do is it would generate scenarios. I'll tell you how. Okay, it will generate scenarios because the scenarios will give you um, will give you a the ability to calculate your PNL, your profit and loss under each of those scenarios. You have a portfolio as a function of what happens in the market, whether it's the fixed income market, whether it's the stock market, whether it's the currency market. Then you're gonna make money or lose money. So that gives you a probability distribution for your uh, profit and loss. And then you look, you're, then you're going to look at the uh, um, uh, percentile of that according to the confidence interval that you specify. So if it's 95%, then you will look at the five percentile of the loss part of that distribution as we have here. Okay. Um, so that's what value at risk was. Imagine, imagine, and this was written into law. There is a part of the regulation where the probability is expressed. Uh, there's a sum and this, they say exactly how many days and all of this is specified as laws are specified. As you know, laws are hardly ever specified with formulas uh, because formulas, they, they, they would only make it into law if they can be interpreted by a judge. That means that the formula has to be something that will have no, no, uh, no discussion uh, in in court, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what value at risk was, and this was a tremendous change for the banking sector. And all of these things had to be implemented by people who had very good understanding of this. So people like you, uh, uh, banks, when this uh, became law, they had to hire people like you because. The implementation of this was not easy. Portfolios in banks are complicated. They have very complicated derivatives in them. That, and you need to understand how to calculate everything that I just mentioned earlier. It looks very simple, but that calculation has to be done. And not only very carefully, it has to be done in such a way that the, regula the regulators will have to look through it, understand it, and approve it. Hmm? So this became a business. This became a job. Mm -hmm. Now, to understand this a little bit better, let me go through some um, situations where we can see how this thing is done in a practical term. Uh, the first thing I'm going to discuss is what's called the Gaussian value at risk. If you assume your portfolio has a Gaussian distribution, then the profit and loss is a Gaussian, and therefore I know the probability density for that is the Gaussian distribution. Therefore, I know 
the probability that my profit and loss is less than or equal to a, to a, to a certain number. Because this is given by Gaussian distribution, I can, as usual, I can normalize my uh, probability distribution function with its mean and standard deviation, and the probability that my profit and loss is less than or equal to a certain number is given by a Gaussian distribution. And this is something that you can calculate looking, at, looking it up on a table or using the uh, quantile function that every computer can calculate for you. <clears throat> and the result of this is that <clears throat> the value at risk is going to be equal to um, a multiple of the standard deviation with the modification for the expected return. The modification um, for the expected return is not interesting to us. What's interesting to me is the multiple of the standard deviation that the value at risk will be equal to. And this is what's given by the quantile of the Gaussian. The 95% quantile of the Gaussian is 1.65. The 99% quantile of the Gaussian is 2.33. You know these numbers. You have seen probability. So the result of this is that if you have a certain portfolio with a certain standard deviation, then its value at risk in this case is just the multiplication of that standard deviation by the appropriate quantile. Okay, now that's the case for a Gaussian portfolio. You can imagine that Gaussian portfolios are not very common, uh, and this is this is not done in practice. Um, the type of a calculation required by the regulators is much more um, actually it's much more onerous than this, and it's much more accurate than simply to assume that your portfolio is Gaussian. But it's good to have this in mind <clears throat> because it gives us a good benchmark. It gives us a good benchmark for a Gaussian portfolio to understand that my, Gauss, my that my value at risk is a function of the volatility, where the confidence interval is mapped back and forth with the Gaussian quantile. Gives me a very good uh, intuition as to what my value at risk is. Okay, now this is what things were for a Gaussian portfolio. Portfolios are now Gaussian. We'll have to do something different uh, to understand this, okay? Um, but let me start with one example, and this is perhaps an example that I would like um, for you to think about, or maybe I'll do it, I don't know. Um, I don't have a very good sense of what you do if I just do this on Zoom. But So let me go through this example, and then I'll see if I whether I do it or I let you do it. Assume I have a portfolio, with a single asset, it's a stock, ABC. Hmm? And I have $5 million allocated to stock ABC. That's what my portfolio is. And I assume that the probability, the, sorry, the volatility of that stock is 3% for a one year period, 3%. What would the one day value at risk with 95% confidence B. I have the volatility, which is the daily volatility of 3%. That means that my stock can go up and down by about 3% every given day. Um, therefore, I apply the formula that I have from before. And that means that my one day value at risk with these characteristics is about a quarter of a million dollars. Okay. That's if my portfolio is Gaussian and equal to that particular stock. The one year would be the square root of 365 because it's a Gaussian distribution and it scales like the square root of time times the one day value at risk. And that's about $5 million. There's something very interesting here. It's almost the same. That means that with a, such a volatile stock, 3% per day, after a year, 
there is about a 5% chance I can lose everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and value at risk will attach that value to your possible losses. Okay, this is under the Gaussian assumption. Now, let me go to multivariate Gaussians. So now my portfolio is going to have not one, but say two stocks. What happens in that case? I have here the uh, probability distribution function for a Gaussian distribution. I'm doing this in dimension two, so I, I only need the correlation number, which I have there. That's the probability density for the Gaussian, and that's the cumulative distribution function for the Gaussian. So what happens in this case? <clears throat> Let's look at this formula. Hmm? We're going to do the same, but here I want you to understand a few things. The first thing is, um, I assume you've seen the, <laughs> I know you have seen the multivariate Gaussian density many times. Um, I'm going to, um, in the case of only two variables, I can write this with the correlation number only there. Uh, this is the marginal mean for the two um, variables that I have, or two stocks or two assets, X and Y, and then I have the marginal standard deviations. It's a given by this. <clears throat> That's my covariance matrix. The covariance matrix is going to be very important for us going forward to understand risk. That will be then my multivariate distribution if I go beyond two assets. Okay. Uh, that's the matrix inverse. And that's a matrix determinant. So in this situation, um, I can create the N dimensional value at risk calculation. If I, my variables are all jointly Gaussian, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about this later, okay? If my variables are jointly Gaussian, then their distribution density is given by a Gaussian distribution like I have there. And the linear combination of Gaussian variables is a Gaussian variable, and the um, mean is this is the linear um, expression of the mean, the linear combination of the means, and the standard deviation, I have it here, is the matrix product between the covariance matrix of the assets and the vector of weights that I have in my linear combination of assets. So the thing is the n-dimensional Gaussian value at risk boils down to the one-dimensional value at risk that we did, where this standard deviation takes the form for the n-dimensional value at risk calculation. Okay, so the n-dimensional Gaussian value at risk is the same as the one-dimensional Gaussian value at risk. This is very important because a multi body problems or situations where you have a lot of assets are very difficult to deal with. In the case of Gaussian distributions, it's exactly the same. Now, no one says that portfolios are multivariate Gaussians. In fact, they are not. But also, again, it's good to have these things as a benchmark so that we understand what we're dealing with in a more or less um, um, a simple way. Okay, so from this perspective, what we can see is that the portfolio with Gaussian factors is going to have a value at risk which is equal to exactly the same formula we had before. The volatility calculated in this way with the, with the variance covariance matrix multiplying the asset vector and then amplified by the by the a quantile function of the Gaussian according to the confidence level that I'm aiming for. Also very easy. So the multivariate Gaussian is a very simple calculation. Now, I mentioned to you earlier about a document done by JP Morgan called the risk matrix. 
let me tell you one of the chapters about the risk matrix implementation. And I do this not because this is difficult, not because it's easy. It's just uh, to display something that was proposed and accepted as regulation for the banking sector. And this is um, a methodology in the risk matrix document to calculate the value at risk of a single investment of an investment portfolio. It assumes that the investment returns follows a normal distribution over a period of time, just like we did before. And what it does is this, it's going to do an approximation of the portfolio value, I denoted that by R, the risk factor I denoted by capital R, and the value of my portfolio, P, the risk factor R, is going to be equal to, by the Taylor expansion, is going to be the value of my portfolio today with the observed values today times the derivative of my portfolio value with respect to the risk factor multiplied by the change of risk factor between today and tomorrow and then possibly higher order terms. Now, let me spend some time on this. You all recognize this is Taylor's formula. You also recognize that these are the sensitivities that we presented in the previous class. In the previous class, I told you how the sensitivities were there to understand how my prices would change as a function of factors uh, changing. But now they come up as one of the things that I announced last week, which is that sensitivities would be useful for risk management purposes. If I want to understand the value of the portfolio today versus the value of the portfolio tomorrow, and I look at it and I just take the difference, if I am not able to calculate those values very accurately, that will be equivalent to, for example, measuring my weight by taking the weight of the earth with and without me, and then take the difference. For sure, that's going to give you exactly my weight, but a very small error in my measurement is going to render my calculation useless. If, on the other hand, I use an approximation method, sometimes I can gain more accuracy. So despite the fact that what you have here is <clears throat> theoretical and possibly, possibly inaccurate, there are situations where it could be more reliable than calculating the value of the portfolio themselves. Sometimes the value of these portfolios are very hard to calculate, okay? Accurately. Imagine calculating the worth of the earth with and without me, and then you take the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, this approach is different. This approach just goes into how the portfolio values would change by looking at the portfolio derivatives, what we call the sensitivities. And I remind you, in our discussion last week, the first derivative, we call it the delta. The second, we call it the gamma. Hmm? These are just names. Um, we did this in the context where the risk factor was the asset price, and this was a call option price. That's the context in which we did it um, last week. <clears throat> but this works all the time. When I have any portfolio with value P, as if with, with a one or several risk factors that affect the value of the portfolio. This is Taylor's formula. Okay. So that's my portfolio value. That's the future value of my risk factor. That's the value that I observe today. So this is known. And these are my portfolio sensitivities. Let's apply this to the case of a bond. Let's say that I have a bond. I know what, what is the, the bond, very simple bond with a notional, no coupon payments and a function of interest rates. The value of my bond is here. So the delta of my bond is going to be that expression that I have there. So this is something that I can calculate and then I can plug that explicitly into my expression here. This doesn't, doesn't have to be for derivatives, as we saw last week. This could be for anything. This is Taylor's formula. It works all the time. Hmm? So 
So if I truncate and I keep only my linear term, my linear term is going to allow me to do what? This is my portfolio price. This is value today. And what is this? This is the sum of risk factors multiplied by numbers. So if, for example, I were to assume that uh, my factors are Gaussian, what this would be? That is the sum of Gaussian random variables. So we follow under the Gaussian, possibly one dimensional, possibly n dimensional, but we follow under the Gaussian value at risk calculation that we saw earlier. And that tells me that I can calculate the value at risk with the formula that we have seen now for the third time. For the third time. The difference is that this sigma that I have here is going to include the portfolio sensitivities in its calculation. If I do this for a single risk factor, then uh, sigma is going to be given by the volatility of my risk factor times the delta. If the portfolio depends on a risk factor vector, then the sigma will be the matrix multiplication of the variance covariance matrix of my risk factors times the deltas of my portfolio to each of the risk factors, matricial product, square root, as we saw before. You see? So all of these things are quite simple and they are extensions of very simple concepts that you have seen in probability. Okay. Let me go at another example. Let's say that I have a portfolio of now two assets. One which is worth 5 million allocated to stock ABC, same as before, and 8 million allocated to stock DEF. Let's calculate the value at risk of this portfolio. I'm going to assume a volatility for a stock um, uh, ABC and DEF to be 2.98% for, for ABC and 1.67% for DEF, daily volatilities. This is the, the prices that we expect to see change on a daily basis for those stocks. Let's say the correlation between those stocks is 0.67. Then the daily volatility of my portfolio is this, is the square root of this matrix multiplication of weights and volatilities and uh, correlations. The one day var would then be obtained multiplying the volatility by the corresponding quantile of the Gaussian and is $340,000. And the one, year the one year value at risk would be 365 square root times that, $6.5 million. This is under the delta normal approximation or assuming that my portfolio is multivariate with uh, this probabilistic or statistical assumptions about the volatility and correlation of the assets. Okay? This is simple stuff. These are good benchmarks. These are mathematical calculations. They're not done like this in the bank. Okay? Uh, but these are very simple calculations that allow some control of my value at risk calculations as a function of, for example, portfolio sensitivities. So portfolio sensitivities, or what we call the Greeks, are very important in our context now. And I'm just going to review them for you very quickly, and then we'll take a break. And then I'll continue with, uh, you know, risk management. But now we have climbed the Basel uh, implementation, Basel 1 of 1997. Okay, with this, you get a good idea of what it is that was done at that time. Uh, so portfolio sensitivities, um, what they do is they give us control of the portfolio changes. When the changes in, in prices are, when the changes of the risk factors are not very large, Remember, they are derivatives, so they're supposed to give you good answers in a very small change part of the uh, pricing framework. Hmm? The delta measures the rate of change of our portfolio with respect to the risk factor. I call the risk factor R. There could be anything. It could be stock prices, interest rates, or co 
commodity prices are. <clears throat> and when we have several uh, risk factors, then the delta becomes a vector of partial derivatives of the value of my portfolio with respect to each of the risk factors. And by the way, this vector in typ typically could be hundreds of maybe thousands of variables, right? You can have lots of uh, yield rates in different currencies, different stocks. Hmm? The gamma is the second derivative. We saw that last week, we see it again. Just that now uh, the second derivative could also be, could be a number or when you have several risk factors, it will be a matrix. Vega is the derivative with respect to the volatility. We saw that last week and now it's practically the same. And I remind you that sometimes the risk factor is not the actual historical volatility, but is the observed implied volatility. So the volatility that you would imply from option prices. So here's interesting because sometimes in this expression, the volatility is the one implied by, for example, a black scholes type formula, <clears throat> if you're dealing with instruments that are dependent on volatility estimations that you don't know, but you observe the price, okay? As we saw also last week. And <clears throat> now that we are talking about uh, Vega from a risk management perspective, I'll tell you something interesting that you should know, which is that um, Depend, if, if you're looking at a trading strategies or investment strategies that we will see a few weeks from now, there is a distinction between what's called short vol or long vol strategies. Long vol strategies are typical. These are strategies where, as sorry, <laughs> they're atypical. A long vol strategy is a strategy that when the volatility goes up, your performance goes up. And a short vol is one in which when the volatility goes up, your performance goes down. Okay, so most um, trading strategies are short vol. When the volatility goes up, your, performan your performance goes down, you get hurt. A long vol are rare and typically desirable by investors. These are strategies where when the volatility goes up, your performance goes up. Hmm? Why are they so desirable? Because typically volatility goes up during times of crisis when nothing works. So if you are, for example, a hedge fund, that has good performance when volatility is high, then you become a very interesting service provider, providing a product of rare qualities, okay? That gives performance when the market is in trouble, for example. Um, <clears throat> uh, there are other um, volatility, there are other sensitivities. Theta was the one uh, sensitivity with respect to time. Rho was the sensitivity with respect to interest rates. We saw that last week. I don't have very much to see about this. But um, at this point, having presented this thing that I just told you, this opens up the door to a whole new topic, which is how value at risk is actually done in a practical context. And that's through a Monte Carlo simulation uh, framework. Uh, the delta normal, or the Gaussian bar that we have seen are good benchmarks. They are ex ex explicit analytic formulas that help us understand and get a, 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 get, a, get a sense of what the volatility is. But in practice, these things are not done like that. So what we're gonna do now is I'm going to, now I'm gonna take a break. I may take two breaks today because things will change when I talk about climate risk a little bit later. So we'll take a 10 minute break now. We'll come back. I'll tell you about Monte Carlo and the effects of this into risk management. And then we'll probably take another break before we talk about climate change and what's happening in the markets today. So we take a 10 minute break. Now, before I tell you about Monte Carlo, let, let's reflect on what we just saw in the context of understanding risk measures or understanding regulatory capital or understanding how one would go about looking at the possible losses of your portfolio. What we said is between today and tomorrow, things can happen. 
some of those things will lead to portfolio losses, some may lead to portfolio gains. And the discussion was about taking into account what could happen tomorrow, what is the loss part of the distribution that I worry about. That is what we are concerned with. Now, if the portfolio is Gaussian, then we have a certain way of, of understanding that. But if it's not, then one needs to have other ways. In practice, the way these things are done in a regulatory environment is through the creation of scenarios which are given by historical distributions. So in other words, you look at what happened in the past, you understand the changes that markets have done over the last five years, for example, and say, well, what if between today and tomorrow, the changes that happen is what happened over the last five years. That will give you a probability distribution, and then you can start to do statistics based on that. That's one way, and this is the way it's typically done. But there's another way which is somewhere in between, and that is I'm going to generate scenarios between today and tomorrow, taking into account what happened, but also I'm going to create some new ones that have not happened yet. And I'm not going to assume necessarily that my, that my distribution is uh, Gaussian. We will see how we do that um, in, in a few minutes, maybe half an hour. Mm -hmm. So, but let me start with a simple situation of how do I generate scenarios between today and tomorrow when I don't know what they would be. So let me, let me put that as a question. I'm going to start with a question. This question is going to be the basic question for, for our theory here. If I give you a data um, distribution, I give you the probability, Okay, this is the probability distribution, either because I get it from history or because it's given to me by a regulator or it's because my worst case scenario given to me by, you know, my credit risk department. Doesn't matter. Let's say that this is your distribution and now you need to generate samples, say, between today and tomorrow, that will be distributed exactly according to that distribution. How would you do that? That's a question I have for you. So I want you to think about, I want to give you the answer. Uh, and you probably have the answer in front of you. Maybe you downloaded my notes and you have it. But how would you do this? Any answer? Simplest answer, I'd say we're just okay. Well, if we give a probability of, well, I'll make the certain portion of these samples do that, and certain portion of samples do that of the other thing instead to follow the probability distribution. How? But yeah. Just, yeah, but how do you how do you make your sample make the probability distribution? Make how do you make your samples that you generate follow the probability distribution given? So let me, let me tell you, this is the answer. Imagine I give you the cumulative density of that probability density. I, I want to review this for you in case you don't know what I'm talking about. You've seen this in probability. You all have seen this in probability. Okay. I'm going to, the key is to look at the cumulative distribution function, the cumulative density. Because if I generate uniform, uniformly distributed samples, if I, dist if I generate uniformly distributed numbers, then the inverse function, cumulative distribution function, the inverse cumulative distribution function on my generated uniform sample will be distributed like row. You've seen this? The proof of this is very simple. Um, 
I don't. I mean, I. I don't think I have it. It's. I think it's too simple. Let me just see. No, I don't have it. It's, it's, it's too simple. Um, <laughs> What's the probability that my distribution function is less than that? Well, that would be the same as the probability that x is less than or equal to f alpha. But this is uniform, so this is f alpha. Oh, sorry, f lambda, f lambda. That means that this is distributed like rho. There you go. Okay? As simple as that. But this is the beginning of something very interesting. Because if this is the formula that allows me to generate arbitrary sets of distributions with a density given or a cumulative distribution given, then I can generate anything as long as I can generate uniform numbers. And anybody can generate uniform numbers. Computers give you uniform numbers. So the only thing you need to do is you need to generate uniform numbers in your computer. And then I play the inverse cumulative distribution function to them. That's all you have to do. Let me show you. I'm going to look at a one-dimensional picture. We're going to do this in one dimensions. In n dimensions, it's the same. Okay, but one needs a little bit of a the n-dimensional uh, version of what we're talking about here. So let me do the one-dimensional version of this. I have here the cumulative distribution function of a probability distribution. I remind you, this is the probability that my random variable is less than or equal to a number x. So in other words, the number that I have here, we correspond to a quantile over here. Hmm? And because of that, this cumulative distribution function, as you go that way, it converges to the value 1. Because eventually, as this goes to infinity, then this number converges to 1. No mystery here. Yeah? Because of that, we call these the quantiles, because that's the quantile function. And here we have the variables, the actual variables that we observe. The observed, so if these are the if this is my risk factor, there will be my risk variables. Okay, so in the x, I have my risk variables, and in the y, I have my quantiles. It's very important to understand what is what, because what I do now is I see that the cumulative distribution function is related to my density. The density is essentially the histogram is related to the density by the derivative. The derivative of the cumulative distribution function is my histogram. So that's the relationship that I have. My yellow curve and my green curve are really related to each other. One is the derivative of the other. If I know one, I know the other. And note one thing. What is this? This is the value at risk. The value at risk is a quantile. Hmm? So, what well, the previous theorem tells us, it's called the Sklar's theorem, by the way. What that tells me is that if I generate points here, which are uniform, and I map them back this way, if they are uniform here, here they are distributed like rho. And it's obvious. I mean, I give you the proof. The proof is obvious too, but now it's intuitively obvious because the points which are most likely to occur are the ones where this has the highest slope. And these are the ones that, as my points are generated here, they all get crossed together here. So they, they give me, 
if these are uniform, this production will give me the points with the distribution given. That makes it very simple, very simple to generate random numbers with any arbitrary type of distribution. Now that's in one dimension. How do we generalize this to higher dimensions? In the generalization to higher dimensions, I have to do two things. I have to first go to the Gaussian case, which I will do next, and then I'll go to the general case, to the non-Gaussian multivariate case. So let me go back to the Gaussian case. Now in the Gaussian case, note one thing. I, I, in the Gaussian case, I'm going to consider the Gaussian dependent structure. The marginal structure would be arbitrary. We just see that when it comes to one dimensional distributions, I can deal with any distribution that I want. So um, I'm going to move to the Gaussian case by uh, focusing on the Gaussian dependent structure, knowing that the marginals could be anything. Okay, that's the way we're going to do it. So I want to remind you a few things about the Gaussian. Um, when you have a variance covariance matrix, a Gaussian variance covariance matrix, this variance covariance matrix can be diagonalized with a change of basis. So with an orthogonal uh, matrix, you can change variables to an orthogonal system. The variance covariance matrix is now diagonal. The fact that it's diagonal means that the variables here are now uncorrelated. If my dependent structure is given exactly by a Gaussian, being uncorrelated is the same as independent. But you know that it is not true that if variables are uncorrelated, they are independent. That's not true. Even if their marginals are Gaussian, that's not true. Okay. So let me stay with this case and then I'll make the generalization of this a little bit later. There's one way of looking at this expression I have here, and that is by the following statement. I could say, I could call the square root of my diagonal matrix times the orthogonal matrix, the Cholesky decomposition, which is what it is. And then the Cholesky decomposition, this expression I have here, means that my variance covariance matrix is the product of the Cholesky decomposition times its transpose. Okay, good. The problem with this method we have here is that calculating eigenvalues and eigenfunctions and diagonalizing the matrix is very expensive computationally. Mm -hmm. The Cholesky decomposition, however, is much cheaper computationally. But the result is the same, because if I'm given a, a Gaussian in n dimensions with a variance covariance matrix, then if I can diagonalize, sorry, if I can calculate the Cholesky decomposition of it, which is, I have it, the, I have it here, the Cholesky decomposition is a lower triangular matrix, um, therefore, it's transpose is an upper triangular matrix. And for a symmetric matrix, like our variance covariance matrix, there is always such a decomposition. And you can do this more easily through computational methods than to calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay? The calculation of eigenvalues and eigenvectors is very expensive computation, and this is a lot cheaper. Uh, we're not going to be concerned with computational difficulty. I'm just mentioning that for your, in case you didn't already know. Uh, but one way or another, it doesn't matter. We can decompose my variance covariance matrix into the product of a, of a lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular matrix, which are very, very easy to manipulate, very easy to handle. And this allows me to create a, a, a Monte Carlo method, which is very simple through a change of variables, as we have here. Hmm? <clears throat> with, a, with, with my Cholesky decomposition, I change variables, multiplying my original risk factors by the Cholesky decomposition inverse, and I have a new collection of risk factors. These new risk factors I create through a linear map is such that they are uncorrelated if my risk factors are jointly uh, Gaussian, then they will be independent, which means that my original Gaussian distribution breaks down into 
a Gaussian distribution which are uncorrelated and therefore everything boils down to a one dimensional normal distribution. Very simple. Now that's in the case that I have a Gaussian uh, distribution. Okay, so um, in the case of a um, n times n variance covariance matrix, I can always diagonalize that such that with the Solesky decomposition, easy to calculate by the way, such that if I map my risk factors through the Solesky decomposition inverse, what I have is I have a Gaussian distribution with uncorrelated marginals and in fact a unit uh, volatility. And these are very easy to generate because I generate each of them um, independently and then I just put them together. And then I multiply them back by my a, a Cholesky decomposition and that is the way I can generate um, um, samples under the assumption that my vectors are jointly Gaussian. Hmm? Now, there's something important to know for practical reasons uh, with this, which is that we already discussed this in the past, it's coming up again, which is um, as we look at the risk factors that arise when we perform this, uh, this action, some risk factors are important and some are less important and the eigenvalues of the uh, diagonal version of the variance covariant matrix tell us which are important and which are not. Okay, so this is related to your assignment number one. In your assignment number one, you calculated the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the rates market, of the fixed income market, and as you order them, uh, the high eigenvalues give you the eigenvectors that have high predominance and they explain a lot of the a variability in fixed income markets and the eigenvalues which are very small, the corresponding eigenvectors are events that have hardly any relevance in the fixed income market. So you use this to your advantage in the case of, for example, risk management when what you do is you generate scenarios only in the variables that matter. And why? Is because if you have hundreds or even thousands of uh, variables it's very hard to do what we just did in, for example, dimension a thousand. This is practically difficult. However, if you have, um, say, five principal components or five main eigen directions that explain a lot of the movement in your market, then they may be enough to generate enough scenarios so you have a good understanding of what your value at risk is. Now, these things are very difficult now. They're very difficult because um, the thing with risk management or the thing with value at risk is we look for events which are rare. If you're going to throw away principal components because they give rise to rare events, you may be throwing away the losses that actually matter. Okay, And this is the area where now you can see the depth of what we're dealing with here. These things could become very, very difficult to, uh, to deal with. And there's no satisfactory answer to this. This is why the theory of risk management, as, as, as we just saw it here, this very quickly becomes an art. And at this point, I have to say that everything we have done so far has been good to a point, but I hope you can see how difficult this would be if I continue to go forward and if I'm giving, for example, confidence intervals which are higher and higher, for example, 99% or even 99.9% because at 99.9% .9 to have an eigenvalue that has size less than say 1% is now suddenly too big. 1% is very big. If my confidence interval is 99.9% .9 when I want to calculate value at risk. So these things become very difficult very quickly. We're going to end up with one example that shows how difficult this is. And that is what happened in the crisis of 1998. But let me go to that after I, I remind you of a few things. This is something that I think we've discussed already, which is how important eigenvalues and eigenvectors are everywhere in nature. Invariants are always important and eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I have the example here of a vibrating string. Uh, the corresponding wave operator has eigenvalues and eigenvectors which correspond to fundamental nodes of a vibration of your, of your instruments. Okay, um, And music is built 
on the basis of this. And MP3 technology is built on the basis of this. And MP3 technology is very good to reproduce sound, but it's not very good to do risk management because MP3 technology tends to throw away noise. And when you do risk management, those infrequent losses could be part of the noise that you're throwing away. So I, I hope this shows you how risk management is more difficult than most engineering that is done because it's what happens under the tail. It's what happens when no one really is looking that may affect your losses, your portfolio losses. Okay, so this, although these theories are very good for most uh, practical applications, including MP3 technologies, they're not good enough for risk management. Okay, now, um, when I go to the multivariate uh, situation, let me leave the Gaussian world now, because when I leave the Gaussian world, I am even more disoriented than in the Gaussian world, because now I don't even have a matrix to tell me what the dependent structure is. Okay. So in, in, in the non-Gaussian world, I define my cumulative distribution function in a similar way. Uh, it's a, it's multi-derivative continues to give me the density function as in the case of one dimensions. So this part is fine, but now this is very hard to parameterize. Uh, in, the, in the Gaussian case, everything is very easy. We saw that. But once you leave the Gaussian realm, these things become very difficult to parameterize. In the case of one dimension, we were able through Sklar's theorem to generate any distribution function by using the inverse cumulative distribution function. So one dimension is not so hard. One dimension is easy, but how do you do this in infinite dimension? So in, in more than one dimension. So for that, I'm going to I'm going to do the following. The cumulative distribution function that you have here, the joint cumulative distribution function that you have here is a map that sends the unit cube to the unit interval. Okay? In the case of one dimension, the cumulative distribution function um, uh, sent the, um, this if, if it's uniformly distributed, uh, the cumulative distribution function would send any, um, um, any sample to a uniform uh, distribution. In the case of a uniform distribution function, the corresponding cumulative distribution function maps the unit cube to the unit interval. And any map between the unit cube to the unit interval, which is increasing in every one of the variables, arises from a multivariate probability distribution. So the result of this is that <clears throat> the result of this is that there is a a, a term which is um, defined through Sklar's theorem, and this is the generalization of the result that I started with after the break. If I'm given a cumulative distribution function with arbitrary marginals not necessarily uniform or Gaussian. If I'm given a cumulative distribution function with arbitrary marginals, <coughs> then the inverse marginal applied to the component of my sample for all of my dimensions gives rise to a marginally uniformly distributed function. And because of that, is going to have a cumulative distribution function that I cannot call f anymore. I call it c, which is a map from the unit interval, the unit cube, to the unit segment. And this is what's called a copula. So again, <clears throat> if I'm given an arbitrary distribution function, n variant, with arbitrary marginals, if I map each of the variables by the inverse cumulative distribution function, the result is a multivariate uniform distribution function. 
and then it will have a cumulative multivariate distribution function, which is denoted by C and is referred to as the copula of my distribution. Okay. Now, this has a very important um, effect because in one dimensions, in one dimensions, we can reproduce any given uh, distribution function. We can reproduce any sample with any given distribution. In n dimensions, we can do the same if we are given the copula. The copula is the key, is, the, is what determines the dependent structure between my variables. Okay, so the generalization of the mu of the of the mean and the standard deviation and the variance covariance matrix of the Gaussian world to the non-Gaussian world, the generalization is the cumulative distribution function for the marginals and the copula for the dependent structure. With this, I can recover my distribution exactly. And now I can do risk management without entering into perhaps the mistake that it's in the noise terms that my big losses are going to be. Okay. Now, the problem with this is that the copulas are very hard to deal with and there is, there is no arithmetic to deal with copulas. In the case of the variance covariance matrix, linear algebra is our guide and will tell us that with eigenvalues and eigenvector decompositions, everything can be handled computationally. But in the case of the, of the copula, we don't have that. Computationally, copulas are hard to deal with. Because of that, um, users of copulas work with parametric families of copulas, for example, Gaussian copulas. And this is how a lot of the risk management is done, and this is how a lot of the theories exist. And here now I have a, a bit of a story and some reading for you. I have a newspaper article for you to read. And um, it's, a, it's a newspaper article that I I always quote in my classes because it's so full of mistakes. It's so full of errors. <clears throat> there is a um, mathematician from Waterloo, Lee, who came up with a pricing formula for collateralized uh, debt obligations, assuming that the dependent structure is given by a copula function, just like what we saw here. Okay, all of this can be put to work, and you can you can you can come up with ways of, of pricing that. Now, you know what happened with uh, collateralized debt obligations during the crisis of 2008. What happened is that they were all mispriced, they all defaulted at the same time, things that shouldn't happen, they happened, and that created tremendous, tremendous losses. We know very well why that happened. It's all linked to the uh, selling of uh, mortgages uh, to the uh, subprime, um, originally to the subprime um, um, uh, mortgage holders and <clears throat> how certain assumptions about the dependency structure of the mortgages just didn't, didn't prove to be correct in, in the market in 2008. And for some reason, um, you know, a, a lot of that uh, blame fell on one formula. The one formula, well, the formula is correct. The formula is completely true. It's the use of the formula which is correct, but the formula is completely true. And it's a formula that uses copulas. And it's the one that is here. You have this, uh, you have a link to this uh, newspaper article, both in my notes as well as in the website. And one exercise that I like you to do is is go through the uh, newspaper article and try to find as many mistakes as you can. Okay, it's a good exercise to do, but it's also a very good idea, or it's a very good exercise to see how, um, in this case, a newspaper reporter or even how public opinion views these very advanced concepts that, like for example, the one that we have been talking about here, the, the one on on copulas. Now, copulas is the right way of doing these things. It it gives us not the Gaussian copula necessarily. If you have the right copula and you have the right cumulative distribution functions, then you can do everything fairly well done. But this is very difficult. It's very difficult because you don't have a parametric way of doing copula analysis. Okay, But at least with the copula and with the cumulative distribution function, then we're able to generate uh, samples of any distribution given to us. That allows us to generate portfolio values, 
between today and tomorrow and that in principle allows us to calculate valley at risk numbers in a way that will be you know, as accurate as our description of the market is. Okay, so I will end uh, this part of the discussion here on the traditional um, um, risk management. We're going to take another 10 minute break and then when we come back, I will go into some of the um, topics that I will devote half an hour to that. And I, these are the topics that arise from a climate risk and other similar things. And that will be the end of my risk management discussion for this week. Next week, I'll start talking about credit risk in a fairly systematic way. And for the last half hour, I want to spend some time talking about a new type of risk management. Uh, it's also part of trading, but I, I wanted to spend about a half an hour on this. And I, I thought at the end of today might be, might be a good way to, to do that. And that is the effects that things such as uh, climate change and other things are having in financial markets. I will ex start by reminding you or telling you, in case you did not know, what's called the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. They are listed here. They range anywhere from uh, the uh, reduction of um, the poverty to water to climate change and, and biodiversity and other things, 17 of them. 193 nations have said that these are important. And in one way or another, the financial sector is beginning to be a player, to be a catalyst for these goals to be obtained. Uh, this has two uh, sides to it. On the one hand, the financial sector will participate in the economic activity that leads to the, uh, to the, uh, the creation of these goals or the uh, uh, attainment of these goals. And on the other hand, the financial sector is subject to some of the restrictions that come arising from these goals too. Okay, so it affects the sector in, in, in two ways. When it comes to, in particular, the investment sector, this has had a particular expression into the ESNG pillars. Uh, investment companies for uh, almost a decade now have been very actively labeling their investment activity into the ESNG pillars, and they've been steering their investments, trying to enhance the E. S and G characteristics. And the, the, what this means is the following. If you look at the 17 goals, these goals can be, um, can be, uh, can give rise to targets, and these targets can give rise to what's called a taxonomy, again, uh, the classification of some criteria that you would like your investment objectives to have. And that taxonomy is classified, the different characteristics are classified into different pillars. E, S, and G. E stands for the environment. Okay, so for example, some of the objectives here is the, is the uh, elimination of um, the dependence of uh, fossil fuels, pollution levels, climate change, and so on and so forth. The, the, the inclusion of, uh, of uh, criteria have to do with social elements that I'll describe which give rise to the S pillar, from employment equality to supply chain transparency, human rights, privacy issues, and so on and so forth. And then G, which stands for good governance. So all of these give rise to characteristics that in particular the investment sector is very much um, labeled upon these days. The banking sector is different. The banking sector appears there. On the one hand, they have their own, for example, a net neutrality, they have their carbon neutrality objectives. Banks want to be um, carbon neutral by the year 2030, 2040, 2045. And that means that their whole activity, including the loans that they give to companies and everything, has a, a certain a carbon accounting restriction to be equal to zero, which I'm not going to describe in some detail about this. If any one of you is interested in this, I have a whole course on this on my website. You can go through that and 
I have some videos and I have some lecture notes that you can read. Today, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of how this affects um, the, 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 the financial sector. Um, and the, the one example I want to perhaps leave you with that describes very well what it is that we're trying to do is something that happened in the year 1990. Uh, then in the year 1990, Harvard made a very uh, stunning um, announcement. And the announcement was that they were divesting from their technology stocks. Essentially, they said that uh, they were divesting from their tobacco stocks. <laughs> um, essentially, they said that tobacco companies essentially kill their customers through smoking and they thought that this was not ethical and they wanted to just not be part of that. So they divested from that practice. And this was at the time when tobacco companies were the desired objective of many hedge funds, for example. This was in the 80s, uh, the hedge funds were battling with each other to buy uh, the tobacco companies. <clears throat> and then one of the uh, most prominent investment funds an endowment actually uh, decides that they're not going to invest in tobacco stocks and they make a public announcement. You have the article here, at least the headline in the front page of the New York Times on the day May 24th, 1990, and they explain the reasons why. You could see that or you could think that this is perhaps the beginning of something, which today I want to look at it as a risk trade. It is true that there were some ethical considerations, but this an additional consideration, which is part of the decisions that some of the investment funds do. And I want to put it also under the, the, uh, the concept of uh, risk management. And you see why I included this lecture as part of my risk management lecture, because there is a way of looking at this trade which goes beyond ethics. Uh, trades like this are considered to be also good investment practices. Um, in the case of the tobacco companies, uh, you may know that after, shortly after the decision by Harvard, they started to be sued by, by, by um, a class action lawsuits of uh, smokers who developed lung cancer. And they kept on losing these lawsuits after lawsuits after lawsuits. Still, they became very profitable. The, the lawsuits did not have a big impact on their profitability. But when you're a shareholder, especially a major shareholder of, say, Harvard Investment Management uh, is a very prominent uh, investment firm, then there are other risks that affect you. We, we looked at illegal risk. We did not talk about headline risk. That is when your name is in the newspapers in not a very complementary fashion. Okay, This is considered to be also risks. So there is a way where one could think that the decision of Harvard Investment Management is a risk trade of a different type. They gave up profitability today for the comfort of not being involved in lawsuits tomorrow. Uh, um, by the way, the fact that only the tobacco companies could be sued and not Harvard Investment Management is not true. Uh, just last year, I believe, the board members of Shell in the UK were sued because of um, climate action issues. Mm? The actual board members, not the company, but the actual board members, and the fact that you could sue the shareholders, in principle, you can sue anybody for anything. Mm? <clears throat> and there is an interesting perspective on the action of Harvard, which is a risk trade. You give up profitability today by eliminating lawsuits possibly tomorrow. And this is the way risk trades work. This was coined as impact investing, okay, which is a, to develop a general awareness of, your, of the consequences of your investment actions. And this is now something which is very, very um, ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. The term ESG is used to define a lot of these criteria. And one would think that ESG gives rise to a set of well-defined rules and procedures in place with known outcomes, a little bit like what value at risk was in 1991. And that is not true. This is much more complicated than value at risk. Value at risk has the advantage that it's 
all based on numbers, numbers with formulas and numbers that you can manipulate. The answer could be incorrect, but implementation is, is correct, right? In the case of ESG, these things are much more difficult to deal with. And I, I want you to be aware of this because there is a very good chance that the implementations of ESG in the months or years to follow are going to be done through large language models or some type of artificial intelligence, which is right up your wheelhouse. So I want you to be aware of this because in the near future, uh, a lot of these actions may be done through completely different processes as they are now. And we may see artificial intelligence playing a bigger and bigger role in how this ESG criteria are done today. And that may actually lead to true sustainability. There's no evidence right now that ESG criteria lead to sustainability. They are still in their infancy. There's a lot of doubts and a lot of issues, but they will be resolved one way or another, most likely through the intervention of artificial intelligence. So you have to watch out for that because that will be an important area with lots of opportunities for people like you. It's very interesting to look at the evolution of tobacco stocks. I have here the evolution of British American tobacco since the moment when Harvard took its decision until an important event it was just before the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has nothing to do with this with this trip. And that was perhaps the time when ESG criteria became very important. Okay, so this is about 30 years. Here's a question. Did Harvard know that this was going to happen? Probably not. But was an event like this part of their decision making? Probably yes. Again, this is also risk management. This is also risk thinking, and this is also risk trading. Um, risk management is a very vast area. There's no way I can explain all of that in, in three hours, um, not even in a full course. There's, there's, there's many, many sides to that. But if you see how we started and you see how I am dealing with this ultra modern aspect of risk management, there is a lot of differences and there's also some analogies. And this is what I want you to, to be left with at the end of class today. The understanding that we may be at the beginning of a very different type of risk management, very much driven by technology, with a lot of the um, uh, developments that happened uh, in, the, in the 80s and the 90s, which are now completely systematized and very well defined with the banks, we're not there yet with some of these social issues or sustainability driven issues that affect risk management. OK. Um, my connection seems to be unstable again, but I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I have here a video. I'm not going to play the video for you. You have it on my YouTube channel, uh, this and other videos. It describes the situation that uh, Harvard is undergoing today. This is Harvard today, not Harvard in 1990, but Harvard today. OK, and I advise in the interest of time and in the interest of my poor Internet connection, go to my uh, YouTube channel, look at the climate uh, playlist that I have and find this video and play at least the first few minutes of it. I, I was going to play it for you today, but I have a sense that it's not going to go very well through my poor internet. So I'll, I'll give that to you as an assignment. Watch this video. It's on my YouTube channel. OK, I'm going to uh, go through that. And then I want to just perhaps end by saying that sustainability is becoming a new liability. Every time you invest, you have to take into account what your liabilities are. And sustainability is just a new one. Uh, it does affect the way you look at companies. For example, in the case of the environment, we have we favor investments in green power stocks, in water supply companies, renewable energies, pollution control, green transportation, and anything that reduces waste. In the case of social, we are beginning to take into account community impact and uh, the role of minorities in, in, in your investment portfolio. OK, so this is, again, risk management of a different type. OK, and imagine how large language models could be used for this. Right? So this is beginning. This is beginning to happen. And I want you to be aware of this. If there's anything which is science fiction in this course that I'm teaching for you, it's this. 
if there's one thing that is probably going to be um, um, give you some foresight as to what might happen is this. So I want you to be very well aware of all of these issues. When it comes to governance, the relevance that we now give to principles, processes, ethics, regulation and compliance is uh, much higher than it has ever been. Okay. Again, we don't have the tools to do these things and they can be quantified, but through large language models, we're going to see a lot of these things come up to the surface in very big ways. Okay. I have here a, um, an example of a company that has made a, a, a big business out of all of this is MSCI. MSCI is a pro provider of ESG scores. It's been doing that for a long time. They made a lot of money on that. I think on my uh, playlist, I also have a video of the CEO of MSCI talking about what they do and, and being criticized by, uh, by uh, reporters from Bloomberg. Maybe I leave it uh, there. I, there are two videos I wanted to show you. I referred to you to my playlist on YouTube. Uh, watch them there. And, <clears throat> and I think that will be, that will be the end of uh, today.